Welcome. Our Goes to School volunteers have put together this presentation for you for the spring of 2021. We look forward to a time when we will be back to visit in your classroom. But until then, please take a few moments to enjoy these wonderful works of art. Hello everyone, I'm Suzanne O'Connell with Art Goes to School, and I'd like to introduce you to an artist named Jean-Michel Basquiat. Jean-Michel was from New York City. He was born in Brooklyn in 1960. His mother was from Puerto Rico and his father was Haitian, a successful accountant who loved jazz. And he brought paper home from the office for Jean-Michel to draw. As a child, he drew constantly and he visited museums with, him, with his mother. He painted for about eight years and unfortunately he died young at the age of 28. Even as a child, he was a serious artist. He drew all day long and he told his father that one day he would be very, very famous. When he was a teenager, he began painting graffiti with a friend and they signed their work Samo. Do you know what a graffiti artist is? It's someone who paints on the side of buildings or on trains. If you've ever taken the train into Center City, you may have seen graffiti on the sides of buildings. It's not always appreciated by the people who own the buildings, but it was a way for Jean-Michel and his friend to express themselves. Jean-Michel went very quickly from being a, a graffiti artist to being a successful painter. And people paid a lot of money for his paintings. He appeared on the covers of magazines and he had gallery shows in New York and on the West Coast and in Europe. Jean-Michel's style of painting is called Neo-Expressionism. He paints what he feels, as opposed to realistic painters who paint what they see. And he uses symbols in his paintings. See if you can find some of these symbols in the painting in this slide. He uses crowns and halos, cars, African masks, rockets and skyscrapers, and references to New York City. You can see the Empire State Building and a pagoda that might have been in Chinatown in New York. How do you think he was feeling when he painted this painting? Jean-Michel was friends with other artists who were also famous at the time. Some of you may know Andy Warhol, the fellow with the white hair in the upper right. Um, he was known for his pop art, such as his Campbell soup can paintings. And also he was friends with Keith Haring, um, who's in the lower left. And Haring was also a graffiti artist, and he's best known for his paintings of babies, as you see here. In his portraits and his self-portraits, he explores being an African-American um, and often an African-American in the white art world in New York City. Um, he possesses a bold sense of color and composition. You may want to pause the video now and get a paper and a pencil and some crayons. I have some questions for you, and at the end, I'm going to ask you to draw your own self-portrait. What is a portrait and what is a self-portrait? A portrait is a painting or a drawing that the artist makes of someone else. A self-portrait is a painting or a drawing that the artist makes of his or herself. Describe the physical features in the picture. What do you see with his hair? And what color should his eyes be? And what is his mouth like? Um, look at the shape and size of his nose. And what, is he, what do you think he's wearing? And what features in the painting are more or less exaggerated? For example, look at his nose or look at his mouth. And how do you think he was feeling when he painted the portrait? Look at this photograph. What kind of personality would you say he had? And what features of his personality appear in his painting? 
with your pencil and paper. Make a list of the colors in the composition and give an adjective that might describe the feeling of each color. For example, red. How does red make you feel? How do you think red was making him feel when he painted the picture? And lastly, with your, pen, with your pencil and your crayons and your paper, draw your own self-portrait. Look at yourself in the mirror or in your phone and express how you're feeling. I hope you en you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Jean-Michel Basquiat today, and I hope you'll enjoy drawing or painting your own self-portrait. Friends. My name is Kristen and I'm with Art Goes to School and I'm going to take a look at another portrait with you. This piece is entitled Portrait of Jean Ebutin and it was painted by an Italian artist, Amadeo Modigliani. In Italian, the artist's last name is pronounced Modigliani. Try stretching your mouth and seeing if you can say that. In English, we simplify it a bit and we say Modigliani. Modigliani painted this portrait in 1917, about 100 years ago. The artist used oil paints on canvas to paint this image. Take a moment to really take a look at this painting. What colors do you see? Do you see the warm oranges and reds and the deep purple of the woman's skirt? Do you see how the artist has used large flat areas of color? Do you notice anything unusual about this figure? A closer. Is this a realistic picture of a woman? What do you notice about the woman's face? Her eyes? Modigliani once famously said, when I know your soul, I will paint your eyes. What do you think he meant by that? Do you think he knew this woman? Amadeo Modigliani was born in Livorno, Italy in 1884. He was artistic from a very young age. He was ill a lot as a child and drawing gave him a way to pass the time when he was too sick to run and play. He started going to art school in Italy when he was only 14 and he moved to Paris to pursue his art when he was only 22. In Paris, Modigliani met and worked with a lot of interesting artists and intellectuals doing new and modern things with their work, such as Pablo Picasso. In Paris, Modigliani also met Jean Ebutern, the subject of our painting. And this is a photograph of Jean here in the center of your page. Ebutern was an art student herself at the time. She would eventually marry Modigliani and have children with him, and he would paint her portrait many, many times. Let's go back to our original portrait of Jean. So Modigliani did know Jean very well, does this change how you see this painting? How would you describe the mood of this portrait? Is this a natural, comfortable pose? Look at the way her face and neck and body are positioned. They look like they're stretched out. In art, this is called elongation. Pause here for a minute and go to a mirror. Try and elongate your body. Stretch your neck, tilt your head. Does doing this and holding your body like this change the way that you look? This is a surreal way to represent a body, meaning the artist has distorted and changed reality. Why do you think Modigliani did this? Look again at her face. Does it remind you of anything? Does it almost look like a mask? The figure on the left here is a fang mask from equatorial Africa that Modigliani saw on display in a museum in Paris. In fact, he spent a lot of time visiting displays of African artwork, and he even began to make his own similar sculptures. The two heads on the right are sculptures made by Modigliani in the early 19-teens. Modigliani eventually gave up on sculpture because of his poor health, but the influence of this work can be seen in all of his paintings. Modigliani's mask-like faces and surreal, elongated bodies make his portraits instantly recognizable. He is famous for his expressionism. His artistic style is an emotional experience rather than a direct impression of the outside world. How does a style make you feel? Portraits don't have to be perfect, true representations of their subject. And Modigliani does a wonderful job showing us that. Next time you draw a picture of someone, try drawing how they make you feel or how you think they feel rather than exactly what your eyes see. Experiment and have fun. Bye for now, friends.
Paul Gauguin, whose works we are about to see, painted at the same time in history as our last artist, Modigliani. Here we see a photograph of Paul Gauguin taken in 1891. He is 43 years old. Let's take a minute and look and think about our work by Paul Gauguin. What do you see here? We see a man playing an instrument. Do you play an instrument? Do you recognize the instrument he's playing? Did you guess the cello? If so, you are correct. What is the subject of the work? What do you think the artist felt was the most important thing in this painting? Why do you think that? What clues point to your answer? What first draws your attention? Did you say the cello? The cello is in front and central in painting. Painted in large flat panels of bold color, it is grounded in the bottom edge of the painting and takes up a large triangular swath of the painting. The man, the cellist, is a dark and virtually blends into the background. Gauguin is focusing on the instrument and thus on the music. He is attempting to convey the idea of music through visual art. Do you hear the music? Is the cellist playing? How do we know? The painting captures the player mid-performance and implies a vigorous sense of movement through the cellist's tense posture as well as the position of his fingers and of that of the bow. This painting by Paul Gauguin was created in 1894. It is an oil painting on canvas and is 36 and a half by 29 inches. It hangs in the Baltimore Museum of Art in Baltimore, Maryland. It is titled The Cellist and alternately you Paul Paul Schneckwald. You can see the title inscribed in the upper left hand corner of the painting. This title is a combination of you Paul Paul, a name of a traditional local Tahitian dance, and the last name of the cellist sitting for this portrait, Schneckwald. Gauguin painted this painting shortly after returning to Paris after living in Tahiti for two years. While he was in Tahiti, he became fond of the Yupalpal dance. However, no one knows why he included it in the title of this portrait of the French cellist Guillaume Schneckelaude. This is one of Gauguin's most popular works and is one of the last painted in France. It is an imposing portrait and is a very good example of Gauguin's mature painting style. He uses heavy black and blue outlines and areas of flat, bold color. Perhaps you would like to pause this video, get out a plain piece of paper and coloring supplies and draw a picture of the instrument in the style of Gauguin. Twenty years before Gauguin painted the colorful cellist, an artist from Austria painted a man from North Africa. Look how different the portraits of these two men look. The colors of the paint, the room they are in, the style of their clothing, the amount of detail that the artist used, and the positions of their bodies. What do different stances tell you about someone? If you can, please pause this video for a second and stand up to get into the position of the man in white. How did it make you feel? Did you have your foot up, like you're walking up a set of steps? Did you look down at your computer the way the man is looking down at us? Did you feel strong? Intimidating? The artist Edward Chalamont wanted you to feel these things of this man. The name of the painting is the Moorish Chief. The Moors were people from North Africa. The man is standing guard in a palace. Did you notice the sword in his hand? You can tell he is in a warm climate from the sandals on his feet, his bare arms, and his type of clothing. This man is actually a model. The artist paid him to stand like this for the painting. And the background is based on an ancient palace in Spain. In 1878, when this was painted, people did not have computers or cameras. But like us, they really liked seeing people from other cultures. 
Paintings like this were ways of teaching about the world. This painting is very large. It is five feet tall. You can see it at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and are able to get up close to see all of the details, like the case on his belt to hold his sword. It is almost as realistic as a photograph. You could feel that you could walk right into the palace and up to the guard. Isn't it interesting how there are many different ways and styles of painting portraits? Maybe today, if you have time, draw or paint a portrait of someone in your family or of your pet. Hello, my name is Elizabeth, and then I am presenting this picture today called Braising Up by Winslow Homer. This picture was presented in 1876 right here in Philadelphia, and it represented a happier time in our country's history following a very difficult time. It is post the Civil War. I'm not sure if you studied the Civil War in school yet or not, but it was a very difficult time. Not like the difficult time we're going through now, a little bit different, but also a challenging time in American history. And this picture signifies hope, renewal, and optimism for the future. And I think that's where we are heading now with our country, because after a difficult time, there are always brighter times to come. This picture by Winslow Homer, who was from Massachusetts, was done in a bay. And I am going to ask you to look at the picture carefully and see if you can see the name of that bay. It's in the picture. It could be on the bow of the boat. Can you see it? If you guessed Gloucester Bay, you are correct. This picture also, I always love art and I've always talked to my children about art and books and how certain things will always be yours, especially your imagination. No pandemic, nothing can ever take your imagination away from you and you can take yourself anywhere in your imagination. So I'm going to ask you to stand up next to your desk, but keep your feet firmly planted on the ground, but sway from side to side. Can you imagine yourself in the picture? Where would you sit if you were sitting in the picture? Would you sit next to one of the boys? Would you run your hands in the border? Have you ever been on the sailboat? Can your imagination take you there now? So please sit down now. I hope you enjoyed that little journey and I hope you went somewhere real special with the picture. Winslow Homer was really keen on everyday events once he came through that difficult time. And I think I know for certain that I've appreciated things a little bit more when I take walks. And I have a little bit of homework for you to do after you're done this picture. If you have a chance, go walk outside and see if you can find a flower. Right now, I'm doing this in March. I'm seeing a lot of flowers coming up all over the place. If your parents have time, maybe they could take you to a storybook walk. There's one right in Little Crumb Creek Park here at Swarthmore. There's also one at Rose Tree Park. You can enjoy nature and see the books. And if you go to Little Crumb Creek Park, stop on the bridge, and first bridge, and close your eyes for a little bit and listen to the water trickling down the stream. Also, there's the waterfall in Swarthmore where you can go and you can pretend that you're at Niagara Falls. So live through your imagination and know that there is always hope and beauty in the world. Also, one thing Winslow Homer did in this picture is he originally had a boy at the front of the boat by the sail, but he put an anchor there, and an anchor is a symbolism of hope. The next picture you will have is a winter scene. I hope you enjoy it and think about the things that you might have done this winter when the snow fell. Take care, and I know we will see you soon in school at Arcosa School, and we can't wait.
Hi, I'm Mimi Haggerty from Art Goes to School, and I'm here to tell you about another painting. After sailing on a summer's day, I want you to think about winter, cold and frosty, snow and ice, frozen rivers, canals and creeks, like Crumb Creek between Wallingford and Swarthmore. Here we see a frozen river in Holland, painted over 400 years ago by Hendrik Oberkamp. The painting is big and is called Winter Landscape with Ice Skaters. The time is 1608, during the Little Ice Age in Holland, when winters were very, very cold and very long. All Dutch people spent much time outdoors on the ice, working and playing. Ice skating, golfing, like ice hockey, sleigh riding or fishing, chopping wood, washing clothes, or fixing their boats. Can you find them in this big picture? Overkamp watched people all the time. He liked to paint scenes called genre paintings about everyday life, especially in winter. His paintings were lively and noisy, even though he was deaf and could not hear the sounds. Is this a quiet or a loud painting? Why do you think so? Oberkamp painted noise when he couldn't hear it. He also could not speak, but he could paint and draw very well. In Winter Landscape with Ice Skaters, many little stories or narratives are told through the details of the people on the ice. Look, there is a fisherman walking by. See his pole and his ax to cut a hole in the ice? A rich lady is being pulled in a red sleigh by a beautiful horse. A man is slipping on the ice. A little girl is happy to see her father coming home. A dog is eating some fresh kill and men in their boats are wishing for warm weather. Overkamp used aerial perspective showing how near and far the people and objects are in this picture. In the foreground, the people are larger, colors are brighter, and the details are sharper and crisp. The background has smaller sized people, lighter colors, and hazy details to show the distance. Would you like to wear the winter clothes they are wearing? Those long dresses, the big bloomer pants, the tall hats, the capes. You can tell a lot about winter life in the 1600s in Holland from this huge, colorful painting by Hendrik Overkamp. What would this river scene be like in summer when it's hot? Sports, play, and work would be different on the water, and so would their clothes. Think about how the season makes changes in your life. We hope you enjoyed learning about these wonderful works of art, and we look forward to seeing you next fall.